again, thank you, Diane, for putting all that together. And uh, for all you volunteers, we, we do. We love you guys very much. Would you please stand with me as we read from the word of the Lord this morning? Read Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this wonderful day and uh, for all of your many blessings, all the things that you've called us to do. I thank you for those that help out around in this church. And Lord, as we focus in on, on the, the communion and baptism today, uh, we just pray that you continue to speak to our hearts. We choose today to learn from you. God, I thank you again for our Royal Ranger program as we, they've set up out there. We just ask for your continued blessings upon them as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and smile at somebody as you have a seat this morning. Our thought of focus this morning is on the ordinance of, ordinances of the church, which are water baptism and um, communion. Now, an ordinance is a command or a law or order of law, constitution, statute, or standing order. And again, there's two of them within the, uh, within the word, and each of these fit the ordinances, water baptism and holy communion. And just for your information, for those of you that like this kind of stuff, but it's number six in the 16 fundamental truths of the assemblies of God. You can look that up. So today we're going to look at the two and their significance for us as believers. And we're going to start with water baptism. In our scripture verse this morning, uh, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, it says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. And Mark 16, 16 and 17 states, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be contemned, condemned. Now the word baptism, it's a Greek, the Greek word is baptizo. And there's a clear example of this that shows the meaning of baptizo. In the, from, it's a text from the Greek poet and physician, Nicander, who lived about 200 B.C. And get this, it's a recipe for making pickles. I don't know if you've ever had homemade pickles before, but I like homemade pickles. Mom used to make homemade pickles, and they were fantastic because well, they, they were just delicious. They were really good. They didn't taste like cucumbers because they were no longer cucumbers. They were pickles. But Nicander says that in order to make a pickle, the vegetable first should be dipped, and that's bapto, into boiling water and then baptized or baptizo in vinegar solution. Okay, so dipped and then baptized. Both verbs concern the immersing of the vegetable in a solution. The first is temporary. The second, the act of baptizing the vegetable produces a permanent change. For example, wedding ring is an outward sign that a person is married. A military uniform is an outward sign that a person is involved in a particular branch of service. Similarly, water baptism is a symbol designed by God to identify a person as a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's an outward sign of an inward change. I'm sure you remember radio personality Paul Harvey, right? And that's the what? Rest of the story. Good day. He said that even though he had received almost every reward possible for his broadcasting ability, that he still felt empty inside. Paul Harvey said about this, about his experience being water baptized, he said, the preacher has said there was nothing magic in the water. Yet as I descended into the depths and rose again, I knew something life-changing had happened, a cleansing inside out. No longer did there seem to be two uncertain, contradictory Paul Harveys, just one immensely happy one. I felt the fulfilling surge of the Holy Spirit in my life. He went on to say, the change the, the, change the simple act made in my life is so immense and, as to be indescribable. Since totally yielding to Jesus in baptism, my heart can't stop singing. Now, did water baptism save Paul Harvey? Absolutely not. That's not what saved him. But there was a joy that came when he followed the Lord in obedience to, his, to, to the Lord's word by being baptized. 
There's another story of Johnny. Johnny was driving past a church, and he read the sign on the outside. It said, Water Baptism Tonight. And he thought, I've not been baptized in water. Well, as a matter of fact, Johnny had never even been saved before. That night, he accepted Christ as Savior in the class and was baptized in water as well. And it was also filled with the Holy Ghost at the, at the altar service, the Holy Spirit. You see, the ordinance of baptism by immersion is commanded by Scripture. All who repent and believe on Christ as Savior and Lord are to be baptized. And, and thus they declare to the world that they have died with Christ and they have also been risen with Him to walk in newness of life. And that's what that sign is. When we go down underneath the water, we're saying, yes, I signify that I've been buried with Christ. And when we come up again, I signify that I am being raised to life again through Him. So why do we do full immersion? Why do we go all the way under? Well, Jesus set the example for us. In Matthew three thirteen through 16, it reads, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Now I want you to see this. The Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, who came from God down to earth, is coming to John to be baptized. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? So in other words, I, I, I need to be baptized by you, Jesus, and you're coming to me? What's this all about? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Let it be so for now, for it so becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. So he led him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened up unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. You see, Jesus came up out of the water. He wasn't sprinkled. He was dunked. And they didn't drown him either. I mean, he, but he did go underneath the water. Those that are being baptized are aligning themselves with the written word of God and the spoken, the spoken command of Jesus. And Paul and Silas really took this to the extreme. Now, Paul and Silas were in a city, and there was a young lady that was walking behind them, a servant girl or a slave girl. And she kept yelling out, Listen to these men. These are servants of the Most High. They come with good news. And eventually Paul got tired of it. As a matter of fact, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Acts chapter 16, verses 30 through 34. But before we get to 30 through 34, I want to back up and just look at that scripture real quick. Acts 16. Okay. Acts 16, 16. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit Say with me, much profit, much profit, by foretelling, uh, fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaimed us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. I can almost hear the apostle as he's writing this down for many days. <laughs> because of the next scripture verse is why I've come to this conclusion. But Paul greatly annoyed. He wasn't just annoyed. Have you ever been greatly annoyed? I've been greatly annoyed before, and it'll make you snap. He was greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Now we see here that the servant girl brought them what? much profit, right? But now she had been delivered, so she can't bring them much profit anymore, can she? They got kind of angry at that. It's amazing what the love of money will do to people. They got Paul and Silas thrown in jail. And that's where we catch up on uh, verse, starting verse 30. Uh, oh, before I stop, don't go there just yet. By the time we get to verse 30, Paul and Silas had been beaten and whipped and put in stocks and thrown in jail. Why? Because they delivered this girl from a demon. Wow, talk about being wrong for doing something right. Now verse 30. And they brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of God and all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour that night, washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. 
And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. You say, all right, who is he talking about here? The jailer. The jailer got baptized and saved that night. Paul and Silas were in jail. They had been beaten. They had been whipped. They had been put in stocks, most likely laying on their backs, which were, oh, had open wounds. And then at midnight, Paul and Silas didn't moan and, and complain and whine. No, instead, what did they, they didn't get on Facebook and tell everybody about it. I mean, they, they were so dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ that at midnight, instead of whining to the Lord, they started singing praise to the Lord. They started singing hallelujah to the Lord. They started saying, you know what, God? We're going to praise you no matter what our circumstances are. We, yes, you used us to deliver that girl. Yes, we got beaten, but that's okay because we're going to praise you anyway. And God was so thrilled with their praises that he caused an earthquake to take place in that jail cell that night. Not only did it set Paul and Silas free, but it also set free all the captives around them. It's amazing the power of praise. When we get into the presence of God and we start praising Him, that His presence and anointing can come around. And not only will it set your shackles free, but you can also be setting the shackles free of other people around you just because of the presence of God. God was so faithful to them. The jailer, when he saw that everybody had, you know, the jails were sprung open, not only did they, the chains fall off, but all of the doors were opened up, he was like, oh no, can't handle this. He was going to kill himself. And, and, and Paul said, no, stop, don't do that. Count us, we're all here. And he did, he realized they were all there. And, and the jailer brought him out at that point where we see in verse 30, he starts asking about, what is this? Who are you? What do you? And, and Paul started telling them about Jesus Christ. Him and his family got saved. And that is an awesome thing. God used something that looked like it was bad and turned it around to something good. It was bad for Paul and Silas. It does not feel good when your back gets beat. Amen? Now, I've never experienced a whooping like that. But I mean, I've hurt my back before. I've fallen on the ground and scratched it up. But I can only imagine what it feels like to get whipped with, with a cat of nine tails or with rods. When they beat the back with the rods, it bruises the bone. And that doesn't heal overnight. That takes up to a year to take care of. So they weren't, I mean, this is the kind of situation that they were in. And they chose to praise the Lord anyways. They chose to praise Him anyways. So the guy brings them out of the jail cell. He cleans up their wounds. And Paul and Silas preach Jesus to them. This is the same guy that had him locked up. He preached Jesus to him anyway. And the, the jailer gets baptized. Paul and Silas took it to the extreme. They are rock stars in my book because they had been falsely accused, maliciously, maliciously beaten, strapped in stocks, and praised the Lord all the, all the while. Then they preached Jesus, and then they performed a baptismal service right there that night. Wow. Baptism was so important to Paul and Silas that they made sure that the jailer and his whole household were baptized that night. Now, is baptism required to get into heaven? Well, the thief in the cross didn't get baptized. Of course, he didn't have time to, did he? But he ended up with Jesus in paradise that day. It's an outward sign, though, of an inward change, and it is important. Who then should be baptized, you may ask? And I'll just stop right here and just tell you that there is nothing better in my book than a maple-covered cream stick from Dunkin' Donuts, Okay? You may say, what's a cream stick? Because we don't have them in South Carolina. And you're correct. We don't have them yet in South Carolina. <laughs> I have been doing my best at Dunkin' Donuts to talk them into making cream sticks. Yeah, those are like enormous. Those are like six meals right there. A cream stick from, from Dunkin' Donuts is about this big. For those of you listening by tape. And then it's covered on the top. It's baptized, if you will, with either maple or vanilla or chocolate. Your choice. And I, maple is my favorite. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> it's wonderful. There's nothing better in my book. That's just like the, the cat's meow, the cream of the crop. And you know, a cream stick without that dunk and the river of maple frosting is just an unfinished donut. I'm going to say it's, it's like an internet with no access. It's like an almond without the joy. It's unfinished, not knowing that there's so much more for it. Acts 4, we find the encounter of Philip and the eunuch. Philip was called to go meet the eunuch. And he comes up alongside a chariot where this eunuch is driving. And I'll get back to the donut here in just a minute. The eunuch said, well, can you explain these passages? 
And verse 35 says, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him who? Jesus. That's right. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and then went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So who should, who should be baptized? Them that believed. God bless you. Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, you may. And the eunuch moved from a cream-filled to maple-covered, maple-covered cream-filled donut. Why would the eunuch want to be baptized? Well, the same reason so many other people wear their favorite sports logo team uh, from their team, lo- their team logo. And they're like, if that's what they wear, that's what I'm going to wear. If that's what they eat, that's what I'm going to eat. If that's what they do, then I'm going to do it. The eunuch obviously knew that Jesus had baptized himself. And if Jesus did it, so would he. He was identifying himself with Jesus. All believers of Jesus should yearn to identify themselves in, with him in his death, his burial, and resurrection through the ordinance of water baptism, which leads us to our second ordinance that, of the church, that is Holy Communion. And we'll be taking communion here j- shortly. The second ordinance of the church is communion. Luke twenty two nineteen 19 states, And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Now, to really understand Holy Communion, we've got to look at the, the past, the present, and the future of its significance. What is Holy, the, the history of the Holy Communion? It comes from Passover. You see, Israelites had been slaves in Egypt for over 400 years, and they cried out to the Lord for deliverance. And I know you're familiar with this passage. And then God sent a deliverer to Egypt, and his name was Moses and his brother Aaron. And God brought ten plagues against the Egyptians because of, the, of their treatment towards Israel. Just like God brought the ten plagues of the law against us. When we start looking at the Ten Commandments, we realize we're in trouble. The last of the plagues that God brought was death. The death angel that killed the firstborn of all Egypt. And in that process, God told Moses to tell the people, to put blood on the doorposts of all their houses to keep the angel of death away. When we apply the blood of Jesus Christ to the doorposts of our heart, death passes over us. That's where we get the term Passover. Passes over us and we have eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And to really understand communion, we must look at its past, present, and future. Today we still celebrate Passover and we call it communion. And it's been and it's been part of, it was a foreshadow of the things to come, the blood covenant that God made with man. The present, the meaning of the elements, Jesus reminded them, this do in remembrance of me. We take the wafer here, which is a type of bread. And did you know, that, well, you knew this, but Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Do you know what Bethlehem means? It means the house of bread. That's right, the house of bread. Now, bread is one of the most common things at meals. We have toast in the morning with our breakfast. We have sandwiches at lunch and in the evening. Sometimes we'll do bread with uh, whatever the meal we're having. It's a pretty common staple in our diet, is it not? Okay, maybe it's just for me. All right, yes, good. (laughs) I need to research this one again. (laughs) You know, on earth, Jesus was to be common because God wanted Jesus to be available to all, just like bread is a common item for us. And does that mean Jesus is common? No, he is one of a kind, unique, but he is available to every one of us. Bread of communion is very similar. It's a staple item. It's easily shared with others. Bread, you can either tear it apart or cut it. Well, we have ours in little wafers, so you just pull it out of the plate. In the Passover meal, it was unleavened to symbolize the lack of worldly influence or the lack of sin. We use a wafer made from unleavened bread. It doesn't really matter because the meaning doesn't change. The bread is a reminder of the body which was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. He bore our sorrows, and because of his stripes, we are healed. And then the cup. In this church, we take communion with grape juice, not wine, because fermentation is an enzymatically controlled anaerobic breakdown, I won't say that again, of an energy-rich compound. I'm just glad I got it out once. 
Fermentation destroys the oxygen in the compound and causes it to decay. And Christ used the symbol of the fruit of the vine for his blood. And, and, and how do you get wine out of a grape? You crush the grape. You have to literally smash it down. Jesus was literally crushed. And if you don't believe me, you can look at the process of crucifixion. The weight that was upon his chest from his arms being out of socket and, and the, the strength that it took just to try and keep him up. They say it was like having, I think it's 2,000 pounds upon the chest. Ultimately, Christ died because his heart failed. When the Romans took their sword and they pierced his side, they pierced the heart, blood and water flowed, which is medically, it shows that he was dead, but also that there was fluid around the heart, congestive heart failure. His flesh was so marred that he was unrecognizable. The word tells us that you couldn't even tell that he was a man. That's how bad they beat him. These nice little pretty pictures of Jesus on a cross where you can see him real well, that's not what he went through. He was brutally beaten, unmercifully beaten. His hair was pulled out. His beard was pulled out. And then his blood was spilled. And he literally, his heart was broken for us. So when we partake of the cup, we are remembering how much Christ suffered for us. And as, as Bruce comes this morning, we're going to end with heaven. The future, heaven. Jesus reminds the disciples that one day they will partake of the Lord's table together again in heaven. And are you rapture ready? Amen. Amen. What is he reminding of them? Well, Arnold Schwarzenegger wasn't the first one to say it, but he'll be back. That's right. I'll be back. <laughs> He's coming back. He's coming back. We believe that the time is short. Jesus' return is re very soon. And as we take communion this morning, may that be one of the things that we remember as we partake of the cup and of the bread. There's a song that says, This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't live this in home in this world anymore. Our home is in heaven with Christ. Jesus said before he left this earth, Behold, I go and prepare a place for you that where I am you may be with me also. And it's going to be a wonderful place. He has prepared many mansions. And I'm so thankful for that scriptures that God has prepared a place for us. And I'd like for this time for the men who are serving communion to join me at the front. Our world is not this home. We have a greater reward waiting on us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Listen, communion is open to anyone that believes you do not have to be a member of this church to take communion with us. Uh, there's special bread in the center that's gluten-free for those of you that need that. And if you would, please take the elements and hold those, and we will take them together.
1 Corinthians chapter 11 gives us the instructions that Jesus gave to his disciples that night. As we take the, the communion this morning, remember uh, the, the body of Christ which was given for us. Past, we see the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. The past, Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. He was the Lamb that was slaughtered. So that the blood could be applied to our lives, the doorposts of our lives. The present, he is our healer. In the future, he is, our, he is our redeemer and ultimate conquering king who's coming back again one day. So as you hold that bread up with me, would you say, I remember, and let's take it together. The cup that we're about to take together as well, the past was the blood of the lamb shed to the doorposts which kept the death angel away from the Israelites. The present, it's the blood of the lamb that applies to the doorposts of our hearts, which keeps us safe from the evil one. But also it's uh, applied in the ways that if we need healing to our bodies, it's the blood of the lamb it cleanses us from sin and the body of Jesus, which was taken, he took uh, the stripes upon his back so that we could have healing in our bodies as well. And in the future, we're gonna take that cup again with him. If you need something today from the Lord, as you take this cup, Remember those promises and believe as you take it that the Lord's taking care of those things. Would you hold that cup up and say, I remember? I remember. Let's take it together. Father God, we take this communion in reverence of you and remembrance of Jesus Christ and remembrance of the things past, what you did for the Israelites and pulling them out of Egypt for breaking their bonds and setting them free things present for pulling us out of Egypt, out of our sin and setting us free and saving us from the wrath to come in the future when we can sit down with Jesus face to face and eat with him and drink with him. We thank you for your many promises throughout your word. And Lord, we're claiming healing right now for those that need it. I pray for Pastor Craig as he's at home now. Uh, just pray for your touch upon his body, for Pastor Simon, for Bob Bilheimer, for others in this room that need a touch of, on their backs, their lives, their, their hearts, whatever it is that they need physically, Lord, of the Kent Doling to you. 
And God, I just pray for your continued touch upon my mom as well. Lord, for those that need a touch in their finances, in, in, their, their, uh, in their physical bodies, their finances, their mental, Lord, whatever it is, I ask that you would meet their needs in Jesus' name. We're believing you for good things. We're looking for a good report. We ask for your continued blessings in our lives as well. Please keep us safe as we go out to stand and, and be a voice for the unborn today at 2.30. Please be with us. Protect us from any evil and harm. And I pray for that one that may be driving by and thinking about an abortion, that you would speak through their heart and show them that there is a better way. Give them that, that option, Father, and show them. And Lord, for any that may have had an abortion, I thank you for your forgiveness that flows in their life right now. And may they be used by your glory to show others that there's a better way, to show them the way of Jesus, to show them the way of life. God, we thank you for the precious little ones, even those that haven't been born yet. We thank you for them. I know that you spoke to Isaiah and said you knew him before he, while he was still in a womb, before he formed you, before you formed him. And we're believing you for good things to happen to this today. We love you and praise you. Again, use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me this morning? Thank you for coming out today. And I would encourage for each and every one of you that can, take an hour of your time today and meet us out there at 2.30. Also, take a few minutes to take a look at the, the Royal Ranger table in the back. And again, thank you for coming. I'll be up here at the altar if you need prayer or anything. I'll be here. Uh, you are dismissed. Have a great day.